Hi, and welcome to Parkinson TV, an educational series that brings you diverse perspectives of Parkinson disease and its many possible symptoms. Season one focused on the basics of living with Parkinson's. In seasons two, we are exploring an important topic that is not discussed often enough, mental health. Thus far in season two, we've talked about depression and anxiety, psychosis and impulse control disorders. In this episode, we'll discuss a symptom that is often confused with depression and can have a profound impact on the ability to live, apathy. Joining us today is series creator and neurologist, Dr. Bas Bloom from the Netherlands. Bas, thank you for being part of this today. It's a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. We're also delighted to introduce our guest, Dr. Nabila Dahawala. Nabila is an associate professor of neurology at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. We are glad to have you with us today, Nabila. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Leonor has Parkinson's. She's experienced apathy related to her disease. With her today, her wife, Myra, who has been instrumental in caring for her. We are so looking forward to hearing from you today. Thank you. Boss, we want to start with the big picture. What causes the apathy that some people with Parkinson's experience? Well, first of all, you said in your own introduction, we need to separate, uh, separate apathy from depression. Um, at first sight, maybe superficial glance, they look identical because patients don't do much. When you're depressed, you lack initiative. And apathy is also characterized by severe lack of initiative. Key difference being people who are depressed have a sad mood, whereas patients with an apathy don't have a sad mood. They're actually fine but they just lack a striking, a striking lack of initiative. And it drives, and that's why we felt it was important to have a spouse present. The patient doesn't suffer or doesn't really apprehend the problem. It's the spouse that sometimes goes crazy. Why don't you do something, you know? And that can be a really debilitating problem. And I know, Leonore, in talking to you, um, you said how helpful Myra was, but it's gotta be challenging for both of you because she may not always realize what you're experiencing. Well, what happens with me is that the apathy, I'm aware that the apathy is a symptom of Parkinson's. So if I'm not doing anything, if, she, if I know Myra's coming home and I'm kind of sitting around and kind of doing nothing because the apathy is keep, keeping me stuck, if Myra's coming home, I'll get myself out, out the door or get myself moving because it's important to her that I be well. So it helps tremendously to have someone who really loves you, cares about you, um, who is kind of an initiation um, driver. <laughs> and that's what she really is for me. How did you become so supportive? Because there's got to be pieces of this that are tough to recognize, I would imagine. My being present and kind of just kind of um, initiating conversation about what she has to do to get done for the day um, gets her started on a really good trajectory. So I just push my day to, you know, to later. And so that's what I do to get her started. But then the other things that I do are really sometimes if she's feeling apathetic and I can see it happening, sometimes I just say, hey, you don't feel so great, do you? You know? And just by acknowledging it, it gives her a sense of, oh, wow, I'm not, you know, this isn't bad, this isn't, and then, I start to talk about how gorgeous it is outside, or I'll go outside and I'll call her and I'll be like, oh my God, it's so beautiful, you have to go out. And then call 45 minutes later, or text 45 minutes later to find out whether that was effective or not, and to give another little boost. Nabila, tell us the importance of having this support system. It's really hard to measure how valuable it is. I think our current treatments for apathy are really limited. We don't have a lot of medications that target the underlying changes in neural circuitry and pharmacology that are going on. And it really requires this kind of structured day and support from someone else to keep you on track and um, achieving the goals that you want to for the day. I, have a, I do a lot. I mean, I, I, as long as I have something on my schedule, I know I have to get out to do it. And as long as I feel useful in the world, and I think that's really important to say that people with, with Parkinson's, 
when they get involved in advocacy or volunteering or being involved with anything that they feel needed for, we get out of the house. And that makes a huge difference. Or if I have a, a, an article to write or someone has written me an email saying I need help because my Parkinson's this or that, when I get in the computer and say I need, someone needs me for help, apathy has gone like that. But I know on some days it's hard. And, if and I have you nothing said, structured, nothing planned, and I'm home and with no major plan, that's when I get stuck. And you make lists. So I make lists, and I teach people to do that too, and that's, and that's not unlike having ADD, which is what Parkinson's also involves, is impaired in executive functions. One of the executive functions that people have is the ability to transition from one activity to another. So if I'm working on the computer or writing an email or um, involved in something, it's very hard for me to stop doing that and move to the next activity. And then I begin to get the apathy kicking, kicking in, so it kind of overlaps each other. Is there anything else that can be offered to these folks? Um, well, first of all, um, the diagnosis is critical. Separate it carefully from depression. Depression in general is much better treatable than apathy. That's one. So, for example, when I hear that it fluctuates in your case, that's not the typical apathy patients that I know. So I want to make sure that it's apathy and not something else. So that's one. Second, I think structure in the day and if you can't, and the problem is patients cannot structure the day themselves. Even making the plan requires an initiative, right? So you need someone else, could be the spouse, the caregiver, could be an occupational therapist. I'm a strong believer in occupational therapist who can structure the day. And then there is a range of medications, and we can talk about that later, which I try, but rarely to a great success, I have to admit. And I know that the confusion between apathy and depression is very frustrating for people affected by it, too. Yeah. And I know we did talk a little bit about that. Well, actually, I learned a long time ago at a conference I went to about cognition and Parkinson's that one of the biggest differences between Parkinson's depression or apathy and depression, clinical depression, is that someone who has depression suffers from loss of self-esteem. They have suicidal thoughts. That's not the kind of depression we have with Parkinson's. It has much more to do with motivation, and, and it's a motivational disorder, apathy. But I was going to say, you don't need someone else necessarily to structure you that's a physical therapist. I'm part of a very large Parkinson's community. And my friend and I, my friend Cindy and I call each other and say, what are you doing today? So I called her and said, we have to, let's go to Botanic Gardens. Well, I don't know if I feel like doing that. I said, Cindy, we're going out the door. <laughs> well, you're lucky to, to have one another. We had a chance recently to speak with Robert Sanders, who has Parkinson's. He talked to us about his experiences and coping with apathy. Let's take a look at that now. takes me somewhere else and I listen to you know music and I paint and it's my little world. Robert Sanders says he's in a different place when he paints, a place where he doesn't focus on his Parkinson's. I focus on my painting and it takes me to a different plane of existence, I think. But Robert says when he isn't painting or staying busy, the disease takes over his thoughts and his body. I just wanted to stay in bed all the time, and I didn't really give a crap about anything, so. These feelings of apathy come and go, causing Robert more depression. He says he feels trapped by Parkinson's. I miss freedom, being free. I'm not free. I'm tied to drugs and to this disease, and I don't have a have the freedom to choose and do what I want. Robert Sanders says he was always a person who cared too much, so it's unlike him to be apathetic. But it's something he says that's hard to control. He believes it could be caused by the medications he takes to control other Parkinson's symptoms. I need to focus on things that'll keep me moving around and thinking instead of just sitting here feeling bad for myself. Robert converted his basement into an art studio. It's his refuge from the disease that he says has also stolen his memory and his ability to walk without a cane. But he realizes it could be worse. He is still able to remain at home with help from his wife, Suzanne. But I'm trying to be more positive and I try to get out and do, do more stuff than I, I was. I no longer want to stay in bed all day, even though I do like to sleep. And I'm grateful I can still draw and paint, even though it's more, more of a control thing. Now I have to 
really focus on it, which is good, gives me a good focus, so. Robert hopes to keep doing the things he loves, which includes traveling. I like to go to California and see my daughter, and I do like to travel, and that's what I'd like to do in the future, keep traveling. He's encouraged that so much research is being done to learn more about Parkinson's and to develop better treatments. My hope again is that I can live for a long time still and doesn't progress too fast and that they, the research really starts paying off. So let's talk about Robert's experience. In what ways are the symptoms he experienced what others are seeing as well, Nabila? I think that was a really good example of highlighting how complex apathy is and that it's actually different in everyone. A, a few things came up in what he was mentioning. So one was that he mentioned feeling sad and feeling depressed and apathy can be a symptom of depression. We've been talking earlier about how apathy and depression are distinct, but sometimes people who have depression can have feelings of apathy. Also, sometimes people who have a problem with executive function, which Leonore mentioned earlier, planning their day, switching tasks, can have symptoms that look like apathy. And then people who have, um, can just have apathy by itself without either depression or cognitive impairment. And then the other thing he mentioned was sleep, that sometimes he prefers to sleep during the day. And I think sometimes there are symptoms that can be overlapping or confused with apathy. So fatigue and daytime sleepiness are traditionally not apathy. They're a different symptom, but it can be hard to tease them apart. And I think that's when it's really important to describe like Robert did what your symptoms are and what you're feeling. And then with your care team, you can come up with a plan that works for you. Definitely talk to your doctor about what you're experiencing. What percentage of people with Parkinson's have some form of true apathy? That's a great question, and a lot of it does depend on how you measure it and how you take into consideration if they also have depressive symptoms or cognitive changes, but it can be up to 60%, and if you have cognitive changes, it's almost universal that you have some difficulty with planning your day and completing activities. Lena, take us back. Was apathy one of your first symptoms? Once I understood apathy, I went back in time and I realized that a good nine years before my diagnosis, and I was diagnosed 19 years ago, a good nine years before, I, I remember being on vacation and feeling like I wasn't laughing as much as I used to and wondered what it was. Was I depressed? I didn't think I was depressed, but something felt a slightly flatter and I didn't know what it was. Um, it really took until, you know, a year, maybe three years ago when I heard apathy described as a symptom of Parkinson's, but I thought, wow, that started way before. I did a um, survey monkey and a poster at the World Parkinson's Congress in 2016 about apathy. And I interviewed advocates from around the world who had ap apathy, experienced apathy. And most of them said, a good 80 something percent said, they experienced it before their motor symptoms. And I know, Myra, you're there to kind of give her that, that push she needs, but you're also a warm, sensitive person. And sometimes you just, like you said, you say, you're not having a good day. Right, well, I think I go by her cues. I'll acknowledge where she is. And by acknowledging where she is, she feels like there's somebody there with her for a minute. And in that moment, I can slowly start to say, um, start, start to talk about the other things um, that I see in the world. And what uh, Leonor's depression, um, apathy has given me is a sense of acute vision <laughs> to find like the most uh, beautiful thing and the most simplest little thing, and being able to point out the most beautiful thing in the most simple moment, and bring her along for that. And then I can find another beautiful moment, and I can bring her along for that. And by the time I'm through, I can be walking out the door finally to do what I had planned, and know that she'll be okay too. That's wonderful, what a support I've also internalized Myra's voice. So there's times I'm home and it should be outside and I'm, I just, I don't have an activity, no exercise or dance class. And the sun will be out and I'll hear my voice saying to myself, it's Myra saying, sun's out, you gotta be outside. That's wonderful though. And I know, boss, how important this kind of relationship is. What else can people do to support their loved one? Well, I was just gonna say that I was touched by your words and offering something beautiful each day and then moving from beautiful moment to moment. I think I have actually very little to add as a physician, um, I can say that we sometimes try medication, and we, we talked about it. 
It's rarely hugely effective, yet we do try it. Uh, pushing the dopaminergic medication is always worth a try. It helps to improve the motor symptoms. Um, a secretly underlying depression may improve with dopaminergic medication. Apathy itself tends to be quite resistant. There are drugs like methylphenidate, which we use for ADHD, is what we try. Modafinil, which is used by people with sleep disorders, is some, something we try. Sometimes amantadine, another Parkinson drug. I try them all consecutively. In all fairness, it's worth a try, but it's rarely hugely, hugely effective. Nabil, how, how often do you see individuals like this? I, I see it very often. I think partly it's something I'm interested in because of my research, so I ask about it. I think if you don't ask, it can easily get missed. Um, so I think it's important to think about it, bring it up at your doctor's visit, and um, discuss wh where it may be coming from and what the strategies to deal with it are. And awareness. I, I know in, in all of the segments that we're talking about, so much more is needed, the public to understand, viewers, caregivers, the care partner isn't understanding where that this behavior is coming from. It can create a lot of stress and strain and tension. But if you understand that it's part of Parkinson's disease, why it might be happening, and some and suggest some simple strategies to help, it, I think it alleviates a lot of the burden on the care partner as well. So the patients that I see in front of me were the people who used to always take the initiative. Let's go to the theater. Let's go out for dinner. Mm -hmm. Who are now sitting in a corner all day. They are fine and they're just doing nothing and it drives the spouse crazy. But the patient is not to blame. And I think we talked about that in the earlier episodes and I wanna emphasize it again, the patient is not to blame. You don't ask for Parkinson's, you don't ask for apathy. And just realizing it's part of the disease spectrum, sometimes it's already part of the treatment. Just understanding helps. And so much can be said for that. I think we can all definitely learn from that. We're also going to be joined now by another panelist via Skype coming all the way from Spain, coming up next. Let's take a look at this episode's all new Global Perspective segment. We interview experts from all over the world about living with Parkinson's in their home country. For this episode, we're joined remotely by Dr. Esther Kubo from Spain. Esther is a neurologist at the Hospital General Yag in Burgos, Spain. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you. The symptoms of Parkinson's are similar no matter where you live, but the treatment options could be quite different. What is the main treatment option for Parkinson's in Spain? Basically, we have the, the most of the drugs that are available in the U.S. are available in Spain. So we have levodopa with different formulations, dopamine agonists. So perhaps one of the, big, uh, the biggest difference between Spain and the US is that maybe we can still use more dopamine agonists compared to the US. I know that in the US there are some concerns about the imposed control disorders, but here we still use it. In your practice, you see individuals with Parkinson's and apathy. What are the biggest challenges they face on a daily basis? I think one of the biggest issues is to differentiate apathy from depression because uh, many people are diagnosed with uh, depression and we treat uh, apathy with uh, antidepressant drugs and they are not actually uh, with depression symptoms. What are some of the challenges unique to Spain's healthcare system and sociocultural norms that people with Parkinson's and apathy might face? I, uh, one of the main issues that uh, because of the aging of the population, and uh, now more people live in urban area compared to the rural area. So I think uh, uh, apathy uh, uh, needs to be treated with the uh, uh, pharmacological interventions, but also with no pharmacological interventions. For example, I encourage to have a, a good social life, to participate uh, in leisure activities, uh, especially with exercise. Exercise is an excellent therapy for apathy, uh, so it's, it can be free, but sometimes you need a, a Parkinson's disease association. Um, Spain is still compared to the U.S. Um, there are the Parkinson's disease association groups are quite active in the urban areas, 
but the rural areas are not uh, is, is not feasible to uh, to join these uh, associations. So I think uh, non pharmacological therapies are very important. It sometimes are not available for everyone. A central theme of your research is the epidemiology of Parkinson's, including the global burden of the disease. What will the prevalence of Parkinson's look like in your estimation in 20 years? We are facing aging of the population, and especially in European southern countries like uh, Spain, Italy, and Portugal. Uh, so the, we are our population is aging. So that means that the pre prevalence of Parkinson's disease is growing. So uh, one good estimate of the number of PD patients in Spain could be around 300,000, between 300, 400,000 uh, patients, uh, but Probably in about 10, 20 years, it will be around three, four percent of the population. So we are. This is going to be uh, the second most frequent degenerative disorder. For our Spanish-speaking viewers, can you offer any thoughts in Spanish about living with Parkinson's and your hope for the future? Es un mensaje de esperanza. Hoy en día tenemos que considerar la enfermedad de Parkinson como una enfermedad crónica que, de la cual tenemos un buen tratamiento sintomático. Podemos mejorar muchísimo los síntomas, podemos mejorar la calidad de vida de los pacientes y disminuir la carga de las personas que cuidan a las personas con, con enfermedad de Parkinson. Eh, la sociedad... Eh, las compañías farmacéuticas están invirtiendo mucho dinero en, la, en nuevas terapias, eh, en poder encontrar una cura para la enfermedad. Pero también es cierto que los pacientes con enfermedad de Parkinson cada vez se nota que tienen un mayor interés en poder proporcionar una, poder participar en los estudios de investigación, en nuevos ensayos clínicos. Y como yo siempre digo a mis pacientes, para poder curar hay que investigar y gracias a la participación de los pacientes, de los médicos, de las compañías farmacéuticas, de las asociaciones y de los cuidadores, dentro de poco tiempo conseguiremos un gran deseo que será encontrar una cura para la enfermedad de Parkinson. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Esther Kubo, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a pleasure. Thinking about hope for the future, let's bring our discussion to that in the prognosis, Bas. Apathy is more likely to stay than go, in my experience. So I want to be realistic to all the viewers. Uh, once it's there, um, it's partially treatable, as we discussed. Um, odds are that it's likely to stay in some form or the, or the other. Um, having said that, um, hopefully recognizing the symptom, removing the blame factor, and organizing the day, and again, the motivational elements of the environment, whether this be a support group or the spouse or maybe an occupational therapist, if you live in the Netherlands, um, <laughs> can be really helpful. Your hope for the future, both of you. I, I, I think for me is that um, we continue on the trajectory that Leonor is on right now. Um, she's a part of a, a great support group. Um, daily she has also, um, singing, dancing, you know, and she's also a leader in, um, in so many things. So that actually frees me up as an artist to, to, to be my artist self and bring that home and that she never stops writing so that I get to read this beautiful writing that oh. she writes. And I know you're also a clinical social worker and we wanted to mention that as well. We were talking a little bit about the importance of exercise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exercise, I do high intensity exercise every day. For 15 minutes I do an exercise bike for three miles. The days I don't do that, I don't have the capacity to experience joy. I can be happy, but exercise, just jump starts the, the energy and I begin to feel better and actually joyful in those days. And I feel like my old self when I do the exercise, the one that's extremely important. And Nabila, your hope for the future, is there a cure that's coming? I, I definitely hope so. So as a scientist, I think my hope is that we can start to disentangle the complexity of apathy, of what, understand what's actually causing it so we can have more targeted and personalized treatments. 
But as a provider and physician, I really hope that more people understand that apathy exists and can bring it up in a visit and so that we can talk about it and come up with a plan. Awareness. Ask questions. Yeah, my, my concern is that people, that doctors tell their patients about apathy and explain it because people who have, who have apathy don't understand it's apathy. They just feel like they've gotten lazy or depressed. Yeah, it goes both ways. I mean, we, we should bring it up in a visit Absolutely. as well as patients bringing it up. Well, we've yeah. all learned so much. That wraps up this episode of Parkinson TV on apathy. We'd like to thank our panelists, Boz, <laughs> Leonore, Myra, Navila. Thank you so much for sharing all of your insight, your experiences. It's going to mean so much to our viewers. Thank you for inviting us. Oh, certainly. It's great to have all of you here. We also want to extend a big thank you to Robert and Esther for sharing their stories and perspectives. Any final thoughts anybody wants to say? Awareness, awareness, awareness. This is a part of Parkinson's and uh, bring it up during the consultation as a basis for discussion. Talk about it. Yeah. I want to say it. one more thing. The questionnaire that we get every time we go to our appointments includes a question, have you felt loss of motivation? That's all it says. And it's never followed up by the, ther by the uh, neurologist saying, you know, loss of motivation is apathy. And then they, they explain what apathy is. That never happens. So I think it needs to be more than just a question and a questionnaire, but actually a, a more detailed question uh, to the patient. Let's talk about it, yes. Define apathy and then ask, have you experienced any of these symptoms? I, I would add really um, to not lose hope, because I think yeah. Leonora and Myra are really good examples of how you can tackle the problem and, and be happy. Thank you. Leonora and I are capable of being at this level because we can financially afford her medication. We can afford all of the lay comforts that she needs to be able to function at the highest level that she is functioning at. And if we did not have that, she would not be. It doesn't matter how much love I have. It doesn't matter how much community we have. She would not be able to function at the level that she does. And have the quality of doctors as well and care. I just that should be available for everyone. Absolutely. So hopefully in Absolutely. the future right. there will be right. yeah. more right. help available. To close, let's hear an overview of the whole episode in 60 seconds from Boz in our episode of Parkinson's Minute. Boy, that was another captivating episode of Parkinson TV now on apathy and isn't it a complex condition? We talked today about how apathy can present itself as a severe lack of initiative. We also talked about the fact that you shouldn't take apathy for granted. It should be separated from depression, where typically the patients have a sad mood. We talked about how it should be separated from fatigue, from maybe executive problems, from maybe excessive daytime sleepiness. So a lack of initiative doesn't equal apathy, and apathy can be part of the spectrum of depression. So a very careful workup with your physician is critical. We also talked about how difficult it is to treat apathy. Drugs have only limited efficacy, so the key here is awareness and recognition. Also the awareness that the patient is not to blame. So even though the spouse may go crazy because this lack of initiative is not what they were used to, the patient is not to blame. And I was to totally inspired myself by Myra's words about how the environment can play a critical role in providing motivational cues, something wonderful, something rewarding, in time slots every day, because as we've heard today, despite apathy, behind that mask is a beautiful person who can lead a wonderful life if you do it together. Yeah.